Hey guys, it's Molly. Thanks for watching Make Me Smart in addition to hopefully listening. Before we get going though, will you do me a favor? Subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll know every time there's a new video. We're Marketplace APM. Thanks. Hot damn. Ooh, shoot. There you go. Now people are gonna hear me cussing <laughs> and it's Molly Wood's fault. It's Molly Wood's fault. I did not do there's that. There's no proof of that. Oh my no proof. God. Hey everybody, I'm Kai Rizdahl. Oh, I'm Molly Wood. Hello. She's the cusser. That's what we call her, the cusser. Welcome to Make Me Smart. Uh, welcome back, I guess, to Make Me Smart. Only one of us, producers depending, uh, actually swore while the music was playing. Every week on this show, we uh, get smart. I know you can tell that smart is our goal on this show about all things tech, economics, yes. and culture. And obviously, we do it together. In fact, you keep us smart when we stray from the golden path. Which is, uh, because yeah. as we say here... None of us is as smart as all of us. This episode may have my favorite episode title ever. And I, uh, who in the control room gets credit for this one? Cher Morris. Cher Morris gets a shout out for this one. Pew. The title of this episode is What the Fed. How much do you love that? How, well, all right. I'm, I'm showing, I'm showing my, my stripes here. Look, there is so much yep. going on. I'm, okay, maybe I'm hyperbolizing here a little bit. There is so much going on at the Federal Reserve right now, and thus uh, in our economy as well, that honestly, the smartest economic minds of our generation are sitting here going, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we have called one of the smartest economic guys we know, Neil Irwin of the New York Times, to talk about inflation and interest rates and and uh, what the Fed is doing about it and why and how they're thinking about this kind of stuff now. And and we will also ask him, by the way, why it matters to you, because uh, that's part of our mandate, the whole Make Me Smart thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like you to know that I spent all morning reading about the major theories of economics at science.jrank.org. Oh so God, did you really? look out, Oh well, you, Neil you, and you, Kai. Drive the, you drive this interview, sister, because I'm just going to say I studied over my wow. fancy breakfast. Oh, my um, later in the show, we're going to talk some more about cuttlefish. Yeah. I would just like to warn you now, uh, as a follow-up to our Gene Editing CRISPR episode, a answer to the Make Me Smart question, of course, and we will hear from some budding economists who I wish I had gotten the chance to ask about all these major economic theories. Yeah. They're not even in college yet. Just what the babies, the next generation of economists are going to do. So we will get right to it. Neil Irwin of the New York Times is here. Uh, you might remember last week on the program, that was the article I wanted you all to read. Neil's piece on what is going on with the Fed, why they are um, rethinking how they approach this economy, I guess is a fair way to say it. So first of all, Neil, um, thanks for coming on again. Thanks for having me. I, I feel like monetary policy and cuttlefish in one episode is kind of the ultimate podcast. <laughs> only here on Make it's Me the Smart. Special, Let me tell you. It's the only special here. sauce yes. of our show. Um, so, look, do me a favor, would you, Neil, and, and set the economic stage for us. What was it? What is it about what's going on in this economy that prompted you to talk about what the Fed is doing? Look, I think the basic thing is years have passed since the uh, crisis, since the expansion began. We're about to hit 10 years, 10 years of continuous expansion, the longest on record if we can make it another couple of months. Um, that's all That's all good news. That's, that's welcome. Right. Um, but what's been startling about this is uh, interest rates have stayed extremely low and inflation has stayed extremely low. And we're now in this environment. We got uh, a new report the other day. The unemployment rate in the United States is now 3.6%. Hasn't been that low since 1969. And yet... Uh, in other ways, inflation, interest rates, things have not uh, returned to normal. And so that raises some interesting questions. What is normal anymore? Has the Fed right. been too eager to raise rates? Could things be even better if they had adopted a different approach? Mm -hmm. And also, what happens when the, ne when the next recession comes? You know, traditionally, the Fed cuts rates when there's a recession. Does it have room to do that in the future? Hmm. So that is like the uh, super fast Cliff That's Notes version. Up, yeah. Now let's go to, yeah, let's make this super, super explicit for the people who may come here for the tech and the culture more than the economics. Hey ho, <laughs> why, hey ho, I'm sitting Why right here, should, <laughs> I'm, I, I don't, I'm All just right. saying it All could right. happen, but why should inflation be right. higher right. while interest rates are low? What's the problem? Well, the here? truth is... Uh, Inflation, we all don't like inflation, right? We don't like it when prices rise too fast, when you go to the grocery store and everything's more expensive. That's bad news. But the truth is inflation can play an important role in kind of greasing the wheels of how the economy works. So it gives you some leeway and latitude when there is a downturn to deal with it. Uh, and, you know, more fundamentally, the Federal Reserve says they want 2% inflation every year. They've undershot that target pretty much for, for uh, 10 straight years. Um, 
that's a sign that they're, they don't have the credibility they think they do. It's a sign that there's these powerful forces that are worldwide that are dragging down prices, that are uh, you know, keeping energy prices low, that are keeping wages low. It's two sides of the same coin. And uh, it's nice to have cheap goods, but we all want to see bigger, wa- bigger raises than we've been getting uh, as well. And that hasn't been happening. Let me follow on to, Mom, to Molly's question. Uh, let's review here interest rates in this economy in the last 10 years. The Fed cut them almost literally to zero, kept them there for a very long time. And only in 2015, right, did Janet Yellen, then the chair, start bumping them up very slowly. That's right. Now. And four years later, we're right. uh, we're only at about 2.5% on the, the short-term interest rate. Uh, just for context, in 2007 before, or 2006 before the kind of housing slump happened, uh, five and a quarter percent. Back in 2000, in the before the dot-com slump, uh, almost seven percent. So, uh, you know, we're in an environment, we're in a world where what's going to happen next time things take a turn for the worse? Can the Fed really ex- be expected to to help mitigate, help reduce the impact of a recession if rates are as low as they are? So, because in theory, lower interest rates should spur more. They should spur higher wages, which then lead to inflation, which then leads to even higher wages, right? So you're saying if there's this downturn, interest rate, cutting interest rates is like the only tool that the Fed has? I mean, the, there's other things. There's quantitative easing like they did back in the in the 08 crisis. There's uh, the, the big, sorry, you know, things the big, they can the do big, on the big bond buying program, right? The big bond. Yeah, yeah. they did uh, three or four trillion dollars of kind of pumping money into the financial system. It's not that they have no tools. It's that, you know, there's this institution we have that their entire job is to stabilize the economy. And the real risk is that if we have another recession, if we have another downturn, they don't have the capacity to do that because we haven't gotten things fully revving again the way they used to. And even after 10 years of expansion, wage growth is still low because people aren't getting big raises. Uh, We want that to change. And then there's more room and more latitude, more freedom, more ability to deal with the next downturn whenever that might arrive. To that point about not being able to, not having a lot of room to deal with the next downturn, what you're talking about here is with with interest rates at a a little bit more than 2% now, the Fed can only cut to zero. I mean, the idea of negative interest rates is is a baffling to most lay people, but also something the Fed mm-hmm. really wants to avoid. So, so before the crisis, they were at five and a quarter, and they had plenty of room on the downside. Now, your point is the Fed doesn't have. There's nowhere for them to go. That's right. And you know, there's look, there are other tools of government to try and deal with uh, economic challenges. There's fiscal policy, but uh, in terms of fiscal policy, we're running huge deficits already as well. So we're running these huge budget deficits. Interest rates are, you know, barely above zero. They're at two and a two and a half percent. Um, you know, this is a world where the the economy is going to be brittle. It's going to be vulnerable if things do take a turn for the worse. It might be uh, look out below. It might be a, a situation where government tools are not very powerful to deal with it. And that's something that has a lot of policymakers here in Washington, where I am, nervous about what the future may hold. Well. So, talk to me. Let's broaden out a little bit because you say. Uh, that this is the case, this low inflation plus low interest rates is the case in other major economies. And you say suggesting that powerful global forces Mm -hmm. are holding down inflation and interest interest rates worldwide. Can we dig into those a little (laughs) bit? What are these? (laughs) What's that about, Neil? So so there's demography, right? So you have an aging uh, population uh, in in much of the world, certainly in Japan and Western Europe. Increasingly, that's, that's true in the U.S. as well. Uh, that means there's just less demand for uh, for for loans, and and that's kind of holding down, uh, holding down rates. Uh, you have uh, you know the supply of labor is now global. So in uh, you know with with global trade, if 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 wages get too high in the United States, if if suddenly the the unemployment rate's low and employers have to start paying more to get American workers, sometimes instead of doing that, they're just going to import more goods from elsewhere where wages are lower. So in a global labor market, it may be that workers have less power to demand big raises. Uh, there's a lot of other theories of what's going on. You know, one is that uh, the concentration of major industries and and employers having more control over uh, the terms of of, of uh, setting pay is holding down wages. There, there are a lot of theories of what's going on. But what's crystal clear is that this has been going on 10 years. This isn't a temporary thing. This, this is a kind of reality that we're living in. Allow me, if I might, to channel my inner Donald Trump. And it's going to sound Please. something like this. The economy is growing at 3.2 percent. We've got the lowest unemployment rate since Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. What's the problem here? Problem is what happens next, and uh, you know I think I think all of what the president and the administration have been saying that the economy is looking pretty good. It's true, but if we're you know only getting okay growth and okay wage growth in this environment of very low rates, 
trillion dollar deficits, all of these things, mm. uh, it really does raise the question of uh, how vulnerable are we to, to any kind of bump in the road? And mm. uh, right now, as you look at the kind of policy tools that are out there, it seems like we're awfully vulnerable. Hmm. Is this a problem with the Fed specifically, or is there some other kind of economic factor that we need to reconsider? Because so much of what we hear is, this is not normal. This doesn't seem to make sense. This is not what is supposed to be happening. Are we at a time when we're starting to reexamine what is supposed to be happening, economically speaking? I think that's right. I think, mm -hmm. you know, we are not, this is not normal. Well, maybe it is normal. You know, if something goes on long enough, you start to wonder, uh, maybe uh, maybe the weird thing wasn't, uh, isn't now when we have very low interest rates and inflation. Maybe the weird thing was back in the 80s and 90s when, when every, all that was, uh, was different. Um, you know, look, how much of this can the Federal Reserve do? You know, there is a tendency to put too much weight on this one institution of, with a bunch of these you know, nerdy economists who sit around a table and fiddle around with interest rates. Uh, but, you know, they have been repeatedly this institution that's really good and really skilled at trying to kind of navigate the economy toward a healthy place. Uh, I think they get a great deal of credit for what they did in 2008, 2009 to kind of get us out of the Great Recession. Um, but that said, look, this is a it's a complicated thing. I think you're seeing more and more people uh, in the economics field say, you know, maybe instead of thinking of uh, monetary policy and the Fed on one side and Congress and fiscal policy on the other, maybe those things are interrelated more than we previously wanted to admit. And maybe in the next uh, challenges we have in the economy, whenever that arrives, we need to have those institutions working in, in tandem better. Let me get a touch weedy here for a minute. Um, uh the Federal Reserve, as we all know, has what's called a dual mandate, right? Maximum employment and stable prices. And and That's the cool. Fed has been concentrating really, really hard on the stable prices thing for most of the last decade, right? Inflation. And they have come out and said, we want inflation in this economy at 2%. And they have persistently now for years fallen short. And you say that the Federal Reserve has a credibility problem. What is the problem with the Fed being a little short on its guess? I mean, the American economy is a complicated thing. So I think in any one year, it doesn't really matter if inflation is 1.6 percent versus two versus two and a half. Uh, you know, that's a kind of rounding error. And, and the measurement error is high enough that who even knows, uh, you know, mm -hmm. for any given individual, it's going to be different than that anyway. But over time, the, the issue is the Fed says they have this symmetrical target, meaning they should undershoot 2% as often as they overshoot. And if they miss it over and over again on one side, which is what they've been doing, it's kind of like the equivalent of a, of a driver who says, I want to go 60 miles an hour. That's my target speed. I want to go 60. But then whenever the car gets above 50, they start tapping the brakes and, and really make sure they don't go over. That hmm. person's average speed is actually going to be something like you know 55 miles an hour or 52. Um, and that's what the Fed has been doing. They've been tapping the brakes, raising interest rates proactively, uh, preemptively, trying to prevent inflation from getting too high. And the result is that they've lost credibility that, that they really will achieve that higher level over time. And the mm -hmm. reason that matters is because having a little more inflation, as I mentioned earlier, can act as kind of grease in the wheels right. of the economy, gives them more room to cut rates when the time comes. And uh, so regaining that credibility is something that I think a lot of people at the Fed are thinking seriously about. Hmm. Hmm. That's super interesting because we're also at a time when there's a lot of political discussion about reshaping the Fed. And one of the criticisms is, for example, groupthink. Um, does that lend credence to not necessarily the politiz politicization? Can anyone say that? No one can say that, right? That's an impossible <laughs> word to say. Making the I Fed agree. political. Um, not that part, obviously, but to the idea that maybe there could be other tools, maybe there could be more creative thinking, maybe we should throw out the idea that the market system will ensure a fair and just allocation of resources and in income distribution. I don't know. Just yeah, a I thought. Think, I think that critique, I absolutely think that critique is valid. Um, you know, the idea that this has been a kind of insular organization where, you know, a heavy uh, component of a certain way of thinking about economics and how the economy works. Uh, you know, there's this whole community that, that um, you know, consists of people who have worked at the Fed. They go off and they become an economist at some bank or some consulting firm. Yeah. Uh, you know, they may be at a university. They go back and work at the Fed as a governor or president of a, of a regional bank. Uh, there's reporters like me who talk to those people, and we use that to interpret what they're doing. Some fresh thinking to shake that up is is probably healthy and, and I think could lead to some better ideas and, uh, and new insights. I think the question, as you kind of suggested, uh, is President Trump trying to consider appointees who will bring that breath of fresh air and really bring a rigorous, thoughtful, 
fresh perspective, or is it people who are just going to do what he wants, you know, in a kind of tactical way and and try and help the president get reelected in in a year and a half? And uh, I think that's why a lot of people uh, in the kind of economics community were skeptical of Herman Cain and Steve Moore before those nominations kind of crashed and burned. But we'll see who the, what direction the president goes. You know, he has these two governor slots. Uh, you know, there's still room to to find those people who are uh, kind of have fresh perspectives, but are but are not as politicized. Oh, I think I got the word right. <laughs> you, you totally. Oh Dang snap! It. Oh snap! <laughs> I just Back got fired. You didn't word. add the tization. Oh my god! No, no. It, that's without that's the, hard the part. That's the tricky part. That's the hard part. <laughs> so, so let's let's bring this thing full circle, Neil. And as I promised before we got you on the phone. Um, if I'm out there farming my farm or going to work or doing whatever I do in this economy, help me understand why it matters that the Federal Reserve is, as you say in this piece, rethinking how it approaches what it does. Listen, um, if you feel like you haven't gotten big enough raises over the last 10 years that you deserve to be paid more money, they get part of the blame. If you believe that uh, if you believe that the, the crisis and the recession back 10 years ago was really bad and you want to prevent that from happening ever again, this matters to you. If you believe that, uh, you know, you want a banking system that's well regulated and isn't going to cause new crises, this is important. And if you want for the next time there's something bad happens in the economy, you want for, for these policy officials to be successful at keeping it from getting worse, this matters to you. And so uh, that's what's at stake here. And, you know, this debate happens among a bunch of, again, kind of economics nerds sitting around a table. In, in, in Washington, D.C., but uh, but the decisions they make ultimately play out and, and affect every single one of us in the way we live our lives, earn our incomes, what we can afford to buy. Neil Irwin uh, is a senior economics correspondent uh, at The New York Times, writes clearly and concisely about this 20-ish trillion dollar beast that we call the American economy. Neil, thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on. Kai, Molly, thanks so much. Thanks, Neil. Well, there you go. Now we're all smarter. Like for reals. Aren't we? Yeah. I feel smarter. Totally. I feel way totally. smarter. I yep. I also wonder, and actually it's going to set up uh, the next part of the show nicely. I, I was wondering during the interview and probably should have asked if some of this doesn't just come down to like, maybe you shouldn't have fired Janet Yellen. Oh, just saying. Uh, yeah. But that, but that's not mm-hmm. what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't about the economics, right? Cause yeah, look, Yellen right. would be doing the exact same thing that Jay Powell is doing. Right. Yep. So it was absolutely it was totally Without a doubt. not about the economics. I know, but I still just want to. I, I still I just want to stand up for uh, Janet. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> um, there are plenty of people out there who do not understand what the Fed actually does, its actual role in the economy, including some highly placed politicians. <clears throat> but, <laughs> but we are turning to the future now. I believe the children are the future, <laughs> and. There's another Some song high there. school students out there. Gina, right? Isn't that a song? Come on. I mean, I managed not to sing, but I knew yeah. one of us was going to. Yeah. Uh, bait taken. There are some high school students out there who definitely get it. Eight teams just made the finals for the National Economics Challenge. They are studying big time over the next two weeks before the championship contest in New York. Oh, I my love goodness. That this is a thing. It's very cool. This it's, is a thing. I want to go to this. I, well, mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of like Spelling Bee, actually, the, the National Spelling Bee, except for, you know, wannabe Jay Powell's or Janet Yellen's. Uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, the whole thing, um, they tackle the big problems as a team. Some of these things are like income inequality and the wealth gap in this country. It's, I mean, it's like high-level stuff. It's really real. Yeah. It's really real. Students at Iolani High School in Honolulu, Hawaii, made the finals, and they're practicing basically all the time like you would for a spelling bee. Uh, after school, during lunch, we interrupted a study session. Well, we sent someone to interrupt a study <laughs> session and ask them <laughs> and ask them less about economic theory and more about who's your favorite Fed chair? Because you know they're fanning. They're fanning totally. all over. Stan- I think it's standing. That's what the kids say these days, Molly. Well, I almost said fanboy and fangirl. You're right, it's standing. Yeah. Look at you, hipster. Come on, try to keep anyway, up. we asked him who their favorite fan chairs were and why. <laughs> I'm Braxton Lee. That's B R A X T O N. My favorite Fed chair would probably be Janet Yellen, because um, first woman, she kind of predicted the housing crisis in 2007, and she also looks like my kindergartner teacher. Uh, my name is Chen Yi Hu. My favorite Fed chair is Volcker because um, he pulled the country pretty much out of um, stagflation in the 80s. And even though he put the country out of, in, into a recession, at least the inflation is a lot lower than what it was before. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, I'm Dylan Huang. Uh, my favorite Fed 
chair is Ben Bernanke uh, with his use of quantitative easing uh, during the 2008 financial crisis. How much do you love those guys? How much? I, mean, I love I love Chen Yu Hu with the whole Paul Volcker thing, right? I mean, I know. She's wow. like, he pulled us out of stagflation. I, I mean, yeah, it really, uh, long term, it was pretty oh, rough, but yeah. <laughs> I know, amazing. Wow. Braxton Lee, Chen Yu Hu, uh, and Dylan Huang, Iolani High School uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii. How about that? But I want to know, what, what? I really want to know from what? them, let's call them back, is whether they think it's time to move on from neoclassical economics and rational expectation and have a real conversation about Piketty. Oh, my God. Right? Did you just I was do doing that? my reading this did morning. You just do I did. That? Oh, my God. I am not going to lie. Like, I went way down this rabbit hole oh my today. Oh, my God. It's so. fascinating. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna post this link, and totally I'm gonna are. have like a, I'm gonna have a like a book club about the major theories of economics and so, about how when we made this turn to neoclassical combined with rational expectation, we just started deluding ourselves like crazy, and boom, here we are. So do let us know, would you, whether you studied economics in high school or perhaps later in life, let us know what you think also of Molly Wood just showing <laughs> off. Make me smart at marketplace.org. Send us a voicemail, would you? <laughs> Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to get schooled well and truly on email. And then when we come back, it will be time for our fixations. Okay. Oh, we're back. Look it was that. me. She what, did, did I fool you? She did it. Were you expecting Kai? How'd I do? How'd I do on the timing? That might, that might be a little inside baseball. I mean, I know yeah, I had a little inside this week, but whatever. Back with them. Oh, look, I know, anyway, now you put your things in the rundown. The what was that? I mean, I literally, What's that? thank God. Okay, oh, here's what happens man. with the news fix. As long as we're inside baseball, like yes. this is the one part. Kai and I have one job. So, so, so we've got a go- <laughs> we've got a Google Doc, and it's the rundown, and it's what you know, you know, who's going to toss the which piece of tape and this and that, and then there's a little space <sighs> for the news fix, and there's a little blank space that says MW yeah. and KR. That's the one and job. The only job we have is to go in there and put a little link in, and sometimes um, so some of us do it, and sometimes some of us don't. Although you know, I to be ju- honest, I was... I was the repeat offender for like a year, so. I was also super duper geeking out, obviously, on economics this oh morning. God. <laughs> and doing a, a, another interview, and I forgot, I plain forgot to put my news fix in. So what I did is I just like uh, slapped one in real quick, go even ahead. though it's not the actual one. So you go first. Oh, I'm going to go first. All right. Look up real quick. Um, yep. I would just like to point out that uh, in the midst of, uh, you know, as we record this on a Tuesday, um, what's going to happen in three days is that President Trump is going to bump up tariffs on virtually everything that we import from China um, from 10 to 25 percent. Uh, right now, we tariff half of what we import from China at 10 percent. He's going to bump that to 25 percent and then add more tariffs, all of which is to say uh, that the trade war is still on. And I would this article I've linked to is uh, just points out that it's more than just China. Right. What is going on is that the United States is going to put tariffs on Mexican tomatoes. Mexico is the world's largest exporter of tomatoes. It's a $350 million market um, to the United States. And when you go to the store, you're going to be paying more because that's the way tariffs work. I just want to point that out. Um, at what point does the cost increase from tariffs become a version of inflation. This well, so we, I, we, actually totally ju- we actually just did the story yesterday on Marketplace. The catch is that even if you tariff everything we import from China, plus or minus $500 billion worth of stuff at 25%, yeah. it is still a relative drop in the bucket as compared to, as I said when we were saying about Anil, a $19 yeah. trillion dollar economy. That's the catch, right? It's, you know, if you go and buy a tomato, instead of, like, I'm making this up, instead of a buck, it's going to be a buck 25 um, mm-hmm. which on an individual basis and in the bucket of things that the Commerce Department figures out when it looks at inflation is not that big a deal. But uh, over time, as you aggregate it, it will start to have more an effect. But but in the short term anyway, uh, as regards inflation, not so much of a big deal. But anyway, I did listen to that happening. story, but it made so much more sense when you explained it to me in person. If only everyone <laughs> could have this, <laughs> this kind of access. Um, I have been known to say on this show that when we when we get into the dark place about how, you know, nothing is ever going to bring us together and we're so fractured as a society and whatnot, that I, I'm fond of saying that when the aliens come, we're going to have to <laughs> band together. And a story in Bloomberg this week suggests that they may be upon us. Yeah. Okay. There has been, let me explain, and it's actually really interesting, there has been quite an uptake uptick over the last several years in unexplained aerial phenomena reported by the U.S. military. 
UFOs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're, they, well-trained military pilots have been reporting like small spherical objects flying in formation, white tic tac shaped vehicles, uh, other than drones. They appear to be way faster than all known aircraft and em employing some kind of quote, truly radical technology. And the piece is really interesting because it talks, there was recently this object that went by in space and it has this crazy name, Oumuamua, Oumuamua, mm -hmm. and it was it was like a sphere, a cigar shaped object that just did not look to be naturally shaped. And so this one, the chair of the Harvard Astronomy Department suggested that it could be like a probe it's, it, because it also could stop and back up. And it was a whole anyway. So this Bloomberg article is basically like, hey, we should at least start to have a real conversation based on the mathematical certainty given the size of the universe and the number of planets and, and galaxies out there, yeah. that there could be some kind of alien contact and or that'd be some cool. creepy sort I of government thing like happening. Jody Foster, that'd be cool. Um, I'm, I'm all over this. I'm oh, all no, over totally. This. So look, uh, so here's what I think. Uh, I think uh, these pilots saw something, don't know what it is. I believe there is life out there in the universe that is not us. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's as far as I can go on this one. I mean, this is a great time to educate people on the Fermi paradox. For those who don't know, the Fermi paradox essentially says. Oh, look! Wait, says, hold on. Molly Wood showing off. Again. Yeah. Let's hold on. Is there is there a Molly Wood showing off sting? Can I just? I mean, I, if it's uh, about space stuff, like. Well, you that's know true. I'm, that's not really showing know. off. That's your thing. That's yeah. True. This Go is ahead. just. Fermi, this is now so just Fermi paradox itself. is what. The Fermi paradox is the idea that, given all the things I just said about the mathematical certainty of other life existing somewhere in yes. this universe, yeah. and given the age of the universe. There's the paradox comes when we realize like, wait, if there's almost certainly this life and it's probably been around for billions of years and it is likely to be way more technolo technologically advanced given age, if nothing else, why haven't we heard from anyone? Mm -hmm. And? Well, that's the paradox. And then it gets really dark after that because it's basically <laughs> like, well, either alone, we're either alone or we're screwed. Because they be like <laughs> to shroud, yeah. Boom. Well played, producers. <laughs> I'm gonna opt for the middle ground there. All I'm right. just like I'm just you know sometimes you want to skip all the way out of current uh, economic policy and go straight to aliens. Aliens, aliens, aliens. <laughs> this is how I get by every day, everyone. Now you know why I sound so cheerful all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm playing the long game. <sighs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we, we will. Oh, look, there it is. Hi, Kai and Molly. Thank you. This is yeah. Brent. Yeah. Right. This Thanks. is Rebecca from Boston. It was Marshall. great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. And back we go to the CRISPR episode uh, from last week, genetic engineering and, and all the stuff uh, that is possible mm -hmm. now and will become possible in the not too distant future. We talked to Megan Multeni about it and I asked how cheap and accessible CRISPR might become. Like if you could do it, you know, some high school kid in a lab or something. Becca Weinberg sent us this thought. This thought. It's going to completely transform how we do biology education. And I actually think it would be really cool to have things like kids get CRISPR kit and a bunch of fruit flies and they have to make the longest living fruit fly or the fastest uh, flying yeah. fruit fly. But, Lego robotics <laughs> competition now, but just for biology. Well, okay, but do we, does nobody see the opportunity for peril there? It's like the start of, it's literally like the start of a zombie movie. Oh, yes, okay. Just want to point but that out. All right. It's also... It's awesome. Yeah, you guys really loved this episode. Thank you. Yay, I feel totally validated. Michael Ratcliffe uh, <laughs> asked about this other interesting CRISPR application. I wondered if it could be used to accelerate adaptations to climate change. Specifically, could coral reefs be revitalized by making them resistant to warming waters? I have no idea, but that'd be cool, and it would make a lot of sense if scientists, you know, explored that, right? Yeah. And they are! Oh, my goodness. I know. The answer is Maybe. There's an article from uh, almost this exact time last year about how, um, and a paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and researchers are indeed using CRISPR to try to edit genes in corals in the Great Barrier Reef to see if they can make them more resilient. There you go. There you go. Science is amazing. Amazing! Uh, also amazing, by the way, cuttlefish. Cuttlefish. Go ahead and, and Google an image of one of those things, and it'll give you nightmares Ooh. for a while. So they live, you know, way, they're like squid-looking things. They live way down in the deepest part of the ocean. Uh, they can change color to blend in with their environments, do all kinds of things. Um, 
we talked about uh, CRISPR being tested on cuttlefish, and I wondered out loud to Megan if it was being used to make cuttlefish taste better. I don't know why I said that, but I did. Did not take long, being this being the Internet, uh, for the researcher who's actually studying CRISPR on cuttlefish to hear about it. Her name is Dr. Tessa Montague. She's a researcher at Columbia. Oh, she sent us amazing. this voice memo on how she is using CRISPR to understand how cuttlefish camouflages it so well in the ocean deep. I'm actually trying to insert a gene into the cuttlefish's genome. And the gene that I'm trying to insert is one that will allow me to actually watch brain activity as it's happening because there is a gene that exists that causes neurons to produce a flash of light when they're active. So if I can insert this gene into the cuttlefish's genome, whenever it's thinking about things and whenever it's using its brain to camouflage, I'll be able to watch which parts of the brain are active and required for that process. So that's super cool, but I would just point out, Dr. Montague, you didn't tell me if it's going to taste better. That you know, unbelievable. What? Um, this whole, by the way, the whole conversation about as someone who watched all twenty-one movies about cuttlefish. Did you see? Have you seen Age of Ultron? There's a are, great are we, cuttlefish. What? There's a great scene in Age of Ultron where yes. Ulysses Claw, who's like the, uh, is played by Andy Andy Circus, by the way, who uh-huh. you know, Gollum. Um, he does this whole thing uh, when they're gonna they're trying to terrify him and he's like cuttlefish really scare me and unless you're coming at me with a cuttlefish did, did you I'm just take nervous. us from and from cuttlefish and crispr to avengers is that what you did i mean oh <laughs> welcome god. to my brain oh my god yeah i don't even know how that happened yeah the alternate title for this episode other than what the fed could be oh my god molly what <laughs> It's like this all the time. (laughs) It's a hard way to live. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Make me smart question time. Just bounce around. I'm going. Make me smart question time. What is something you thought you knew that you later found out you were wrong about? And you, I mean, our questions are amazing. Everything from the existential and sublime to the less so. This week, we asked Jenny O'Dell this question. She's an artist and author of the the new book, How to Do Nothing resisting the attention economy. And this is definitely in the sublime. Uh, And this is what she had to say. Hmm. Having grown up in the Bay Area for my entire life, I thought that I knew at least something about the ecosystem around um, the places where I've lived. But I have learned in the last couple of years that I knew actually very little about it. So I started trying to notice my surroundings more and learn about the things that live here. I learned about this type of bird called a cedar waxwing. Um, I happened to see some in a tree and I got really excited. I actually, you know, this person was walking by and I pulled her over <laughs> and made her look at this bird with me um, because I was so excited. And, you know, shortly thereafter, I realized they're very common here. <laughs> they're actually, you know, in the winter, they're everywhere. Um, and so it was this kind of funny moment of like, how many times have I been pointing my eyes at these birds and just either not noticed them at all or just not known what they were? Wow. That's kind of cool. It's mm-hmm. kind of cool. I like it. Yeah. I just looked up the cedar waxwing, and that's, indeed, I have seen that bird around here a bunch of times. That's, that's a very huh. zen, uh, make me smart question See? answer. It is. Yeah. It's like the sublime. Yeah. I love it. Uh, I know you've been thinking about your answer, by the way. No pressure, but I know that every time you hear the show, you're like, what would I say? I know. Mm. And, and you can. All you got to do is record it and send it to us. Mm-hmm. Truly. And you may end that's up on the show. Do. Send it to us. Make a voice make memo. Make me smart. Make, go ahead. At marketplace.org. It had his initials on it. I know, I know, I know. It's totally my fault. Totally my fault. As long as we're, as long as we're you fault. know, letting people all the way behind the curtain. This is the maximum transparency <laughs> episode. Make me smart at marketplace.org once more is our email address. Make me smart is produced by Shara Morris. Senior producer is Eve Tro. Tony Wagner is our digital producer. This week's program was engineered, I hope, by Charlton Thorpe. Yep. Our theme music, great was composed by Ben Tolliday and Daniel Ramirez. And special thanks this week to Ryan Finnerty for getting that sound of the generation of the future, those econ high school students for us. Public Radio, stand up. Thanks to our video producers, Ben Hethcote and Summer Dunsmore. The executive director of On Demand is Tarnieves. The senior vice president and general manager, I'm going to stop making jokes, actually. Senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. Boom, period, end of sentence. Boom, period. Period. It was awesome, the end. Yes, there you go. Boom. All right, there we go.